Ben, first of all, thank you so much for, for joining us. Perhaps we could start with, you could just tell us a little bit more about, about yourself, a bit of background, and I'll, I'll do the same afterwards. Sure, no problem. Cheers, Anthony, and, and hi, everyone. Um, so, Ben Arnold, I work at Schroders on one of the equity desks. So, very much in the asset management industry, have been for nearly a decade now. Uh, before that, um, was was in banking. Also had a, um, a period where I was a professional sportsman for a while in between those two, uh, which was interesting. And then before that, uh, at, at university, um, you know, pretty uh, pretty familiar with the the whole application process to the the internships, spring weeks, graduate schemes. Um, you know, I, I come at it from both both sides really as a, as a student, like you guys dialed in, um, although that was quite a few years ago, um, you know, applying for all these things. Um, and then a period of time helping other students apply for these these internships and these applications. And then, you know, for the last seven or eight years, being sat on the company side, you know, assessing applications coming in, um, speaking to a lot of students on spring weeks, uh, working at assessment days as well, um, mainly in equities and, and in sales as well. So sort of had the benefit over the last 10, 12 years of, you know, hopefully not being too far away from from being a student and sitting on your guy's side. So those memories haven't faded too much. But then also on the on the assessor's side, which is obviously, you know, it gives a very different aspect to, to the whole process. And it's been fascinating over the last, yeah, seven or eight years sitting on the other side of the table and seeing lots of bright, lots of affable students, you know, come and, 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 and see the applications and, and assessment days. But there's obviously a different dynamic, which which will all be coming up in the next kind of four to six weeks, hopefully for for a lot of people on on this call. Um, so yeah, that's a, a little bit uh, about me. Anthony, I'll, I'll I'll fire it over back to you. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. And actually, um, you're absolutely right. You've definitely lived both both sides of this. And actually, I've never don't think I've ever talked to someone in a session about being a um, a participant on the company side during an assessment mm. centre day. So yeah, definitely keen we to can get into that. To, to dive into that. Um, I'll give a brief overview of myself, uh, Ben as well. If you could just move your camera slightly just to get you a bit more in shot. There you go. Um, so yeah, my name is Anthony Chung. I am the Chief Content Culture Officer at Amplify. So you might have seen, probably watching this on LinkedIn if you are, some content. I put out lots of posts via myself and the company to demystify finance, make it hopefully a bit more interesting and digestible to understand on the commercial awareness side. So. We host a podcast of which I'm absolutely thrilled that it's now this week, top 10 in the business charts uh, in the UK, which is great. Um, but unlike other podcasts, we try to engineer that in a way where we're, it's designed for students, whereas other podcasts like a bank will talk about lots of cool, interesting stuff, but often they're speaking to a, a, a finance professional rather than a student looking to aspire to work in finance. So I spend a lot of time doing that. The other side of my job is I'm heavily involved in the management team, both from a cultural perspective as we continue to grow as a company and expand our wings into the North, North American region and beyond. Um, and then just working with the community in general and a lot of the recruitment side of our business, which is ultimately we're a simulation technology company trying to level the playing field in respect to showing students different roles in finance, but also being able to measure their behavior and performance in our sims to then hopefully put them on a track where we can upskill them and place them with our corporate partners. So I have a bit of oversight on that side of the business as well. But look, let's get let's get into this. And this is definitely, um, we can kick things off, you and I, Ben, with a, a few uh, kind of planted questions to get the ball rolling at this time of year. But anyone watching 100% submit a question you know this is not this session is designed for the next 50 minutes you know the handcuffs are off you can ask us whatever whatever you like and we'll try to be as honest and open and as transparent as we as we can um so let's just go into yeah applications obviously follow a process and there's different elements of that process i guess to get up and running <laughs> there's this uh, initial question about um, quantity or quality and mm. the, the trade-off or balances of trying to manage that. What was, what's your, your perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, 
that's a good place to start because that was the headache initially. You know, there's so many, as we know, in finance, you know, finance is a, such a broad industry. There's many, you know, a lot of different sectors within that. You've got asset management, you've got investment banking, you've got consulting, you've got accounting, etc. I think, you know, the, the application process is onerous. If you are going to land uh, an offer for an internship or a, or a graduate scheme, analyst scheme, there's probably 40 hours, I think, of work there. If you add up everything from prep to writing, to um, you know, writing cover letters, your CV, um, tests, interview, virtual interview, face-to-face -face interview, assessment day there is just a day plus travel. Um, so there's probably 40 hours front to back end. So I think you need to be reasonably selective, but know that the that, you know that the hit rate for for offers is also pretty low because of how competitive these things are. So it's about getting the balance with the two. I think the best place to start is really to try and identify the kind of subsector almost that you're that you're most passionate about that your skills are most aligned to so don't apply for every bank every asset manager every consulting firm every audit firm um say right well actually within that okay i, I really like consulting that's what i think is going to be a really interesting career that's what my skills suit so i'm going to apply for all of the consultants there will be some kind of crossover in terms of prep naturally so that will help um but, you know, just sort of applying for absolutely everything going to, to, to make sure that the applications are higher quality enough, I think is going to be very, very difficult because you guys are all studying at the same time as well. And most of you may be sort of in your, you know, in your final year. So pick a sort of a strand within finance that you, you think you're most aligned to and then go all in on that one, I'd say. And I, and I guess a, a natural extension of this, you just briefly mentioned there the amount of research that goes into making a genuinely high quality application and so i think one of the things that has changed and fortunately i'm in a position where i can talk to students and also talk to hiring managers and something that's changed a lot as you can imagine the last 18 to 24 months is chat gpt and that has meant that application numbers have spiked and so what advice can you give then about around researching companies as opposed to just going to chat GPT uh, and using the dark arts of AI to just self-generate that sort of stuff? How, what would you recommend that a student does to do this yeah. in a more authentic way that's going to stand out to the employer? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. And obviously those models have just picked up massively in the last kind of 12, 24 months. One thing I would say, and because I get this, I get asked this quite a lot from students. You know, how should how should I use you know ChatGPT or a similar model? Um, and people forget that the the recruiters will be using these as well. Um, you know, they think, oh, well, actually, it's going to make life easier because I can get ChatGPT to write my application. But you know, that's going to be seen through if it's also being picked up by the same application on on the other side. I'd say those from from my experience, and if I was a student, I'd be using those uh, that software to summarize big groups you know big big amounts of information so if i'm looking doing sector research you know say let's just take that consulting example if you're if you're you know trying to research the consulting industry you know i'd be putting you know big amounts of research into chat gpt and asking it to summarize um that would be really useful i would use it very very uh carefully in trying to get that type of model to write my application um because as i said you know the same types of software are going to be used and be picked and it's going to sound very very similar across lots of different applications so it's not going to sound as unique as you may think it will um so yeah summarizing big 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 bits of research i think is really useful will help you will will take those hours down a lot um but i wouldn't be using it to to replace you know your own words in describing what your skills are and what your ambitions are and then it's great for kind of just just polishing up around the edges some of the language i think and tightening that up um, but not too far. Okay, cool. And I just wanted to throw in a couple of questions that have come in. So, um, so far on some of the things we've touched on. So Samuel's just asked, uh, hi Ben, what would you say is the biggest difference between wealth and investment management? So I guess going back to that, yep. trying to isolate and find your area, given your area of expertise you work in, you're probably the best person to answer that. Yeah. So, Wealth management would sit within investment management. So when you get a, you know, say a big 
a, a big investment manager, they may have a wealth arm within it. Wealth management is typically uh, the business of looking after high net worth individuals. Um, and sometimes you will have just a wealth manager that is standalone on its own. And then you, as I said, you have a wealth manager within an investment manager or an asset manager. So wealth sits within investment um, and is a kind of channel uh, within that. Those types of clients um, may have different needs than, than, than other clients of investment managers. Um, typically, you know, the types of clients think entrepreneurs, uh, think uh, people that have sold businesses, people that have inherited wealth. So within that kind of wealth management service, there's not only the investment side, but there's the tax planning, um, the uh, succession inheritance planning, et cetera, et cetera. There's a bunch of other services um, that go around that, that a wealth management offer. And that sits in within one division within the broader kind of investment manager, manager kind of setup. Cool. And then we've just got one more from Eric. Uh, he's kind of jumping straight in, I guess, but this is probably applicable on the application side, which is uh, in a sense of how to define your own skill set and say like a cover letter and also I says reflecting on your CV and what extent should you highlight soft skills in addition to technical knowledge? So is this really determined by the role in itself? Or do you think that there's certain competencies on a soft skill side that one should just have regardless of role? Yeah, I mean, definitely, they, I think they have to be role specific. Some roles, the, the types of soft skills needed will be, be, you know, be different. So say you're, you know, uh, sales, sales broker or, or working in sales, the types of soft skills needed there around building relationships will be very different to a, a very technical role where most of your work may be on your own or part of a small team. Soft skills are naturally much harder to kind of uh, prove until you get to kind of the assessment day, maybe the group exercise or the face-to-face -face interview. So I think if you're trying to bring those to life in your application, you've got to try and use examples. Um, you know, for, speaking from personal experience, I would talk about, you know, I played the team sport. A lot of my kind of uh, examples for the competencies would come from a team sport. So soft skills would be, you know, teamwork, leadership, um, you know, how as a group we'd perform under pressure, those types of things. And I would use playing hockey at a high level as an example. So if things are around, you know, just try and bring to life those soft skills with hard, you know, hard, proper examples. And then when you get to an interview, be ready to answer further questions on those examples. Yeah, and just on this, what you mentioned there about your life experience, you had that sporting background, but what's your take on, because often some students will have direct experience, i.e. a spring week, and they might be going for a summer in a different company, for example, but finance related. There are other students yeah. who've worked at Waitrose or they've been part of the McDonald's crew for example, yeah. like, so how would you, how would you engineer those non-financial related ones to someone's benefit? Yeah, I mean, I think try and, you know, because th those examples definitely can work and do work. Um, and I see plenty of applications where it's more interesting someone coming up with, with, a, with an example for a skill that's from, you know, working checkouts at Tesco than from, you know, doing an internship at a bank the previous summer. Um, and sometimes they're actually a lot more unique because people, a lot of people want to reference like the, the internships and things like that, which, which is still great. But they tend to be sometimes stand out a bit more memorable if they're not from those examples. Um, I mean, I think really having, j just explaining very clearly, you know, what that example was, where it's from. You know, there is that, you know, people talk about the, the star method, situation, task, uh, action result you know that's a that framework is is 10 15 years old but is still very very good to use um but yeah you know those sort of the saturday jobs the volunteering i had a great application that i saw last year where someone said basically i, I haven't got any work experience i'm a carer i'm a full-time carer for my mum and this individual was able to very very articulately talk about so many amazing skills that our business would have benefited from by by looking after their mum um, uh, and she did that really, really well. And, and yeah, that's one that I remember from last year's kind of, you know, recruiting season and it wasn't finance related at all, but how they talked about it and how they brought it to life and how relevant that was for the, the job that they applied to was really, really good and, and was really, you know, was standout really. Yeah. It's really interesting. Like the most memorable one is actually one that's not 
financial related. Yeah. I guess as a human in a normal interaction with another human, we are kind of byproducts of our history and storytelling is such a powerful skill if you can get it right. And something that someone can, um, without a technical knowledge, understand and appreciate is always going to be super powerful. Okay, a couple of more questions have come in. It's great. And keep, great. please keep them coming. We will try and get through as many as we can. So we've got a bit of extension from where we were discussing before. So let's go back to there. One was about choosing the roles again. And I guess this is a, a conundrum for some students. So good to get your advice. How important is it to tailor your resume to a particular role? Would you advise having separate CVs for consulting, for IB, for asset management? Or do you think that the student is fundamentally kind of missing a step here in that, like, if you wanted to work in banking or markets, they're fundamentally very different roles and perhaps mm. they need to go back to the drawing board and understand themselves and their skills and their desires first rather than have multiple applications? And how do you see that? So to answer the first point, yes, you've, you've got to customize. In my view, you've got to customize. And anything that is put in front of a hiring manager has got to be customized. So not only that role, but that firm as well, because different firms in the same industry, in the same role, are looking for slightly different things. Um, so yes, they have to be customized. And I absolutely agree that if someone is saying, well, I'm chucking in, you know, well, you know, customizing a cover letter for, for consulting, customizing one for IB and customizing one for, you know, uh, accounting, that's, that's a lot of work there. I would say, well, hang on, step back. I think you're jumping, jumping a step here. Really try and work out which one of those you're, you, you, you're most passionate about, that you're most interested in, that your skills fit most tightly with, um, to that point of just trying to sort of nail the applications in one sector rather than, you know, apply for, 70 different programs across all of them yeah makes sense and then um samuel's just asking here about you mentioned there about the wealth management skill set wise investment management and wealth management from a skills hmm. perspective from the student same or different uh so similar um for sure um i think in you know investment management is probably broader there's more roles available within investment management so you've got you know straight sales roles where you're just man purely managing relationships um and that's it and you hand over for the, to the product specialists or the fund managers to to go through the the you know the specifics around the technical side of an investment um you with, with within an investment manager you've got obviously the actual you know pure investors and within that you've got you've got equity investors you've got private assets investors you've got you know, credit fixed income multi-asset etc and then still within investment managers, there's roles in technology, there's roles in compliance, um, risk, et cetera, et cetera. Wealth management, there are some of those roles available, but it is naturally a, a bit narrower. And actually, you know, a wealth manager itself, the role itself will be a lot broader. You might have to wear an investment hat. You might have to wear a sales hat. You will manage the relationship with that high net worth individual. Um, but you'll also be, you know, from a from a you know, client service point of view, but you'll also be managing their funds and managing their their investment portfolio. Um, so within within the wealth management space, you have to wear many different hats. Within investment management, actually, you're more specific. Say you're just doing you're just doing client coverage or you're just doing investment, um, and and that itself can you know, that that itself can appeal to different people. Some people say, well, actually, I really like the breadth of a wealth management role i like the fact that i could be doing investing one day and i could be doing client work the next day some people may say oh, actually I'm, I'm just more suited to to being an equity analyst or a credit analyst and therefore speaking to clients all the time and trying to juggle that isn't really that appealing okay so just before we move on um alexander you've asked a question that's much more IB focused and actually your question about the difference between IB coverage and, and product teams I had that exact conversation with our head of corporate finance in a recording for a podcast that's going to drop on Monday. So I'm going to, I'm going to part that question, Alexander, and I'm going to signpost you to Monday's podcast episode because funnily enough, we had that exact conversation and he breaks it down so well. So check that out for sure. But Ben, perhaps I could take you back to applications have been open, generally speaking, for a couple of weeks. And so taking that process through, they've been successful. 
one of the first mm-hmm. things is online tests yeah. and then a higher view. So perhaps we can yeah. go with online tests first. Any practical advice you can give? To practice the hell out of it, it would be number one. I, I really struggled with them really did and they i was really worried about them because some of them you know you've got your verbal your numerical your logical reasoning verbal and numerical i was okay at logical reasoning i was hopeless at and really struggled um you know a lot of the providers you can just buy packs of these things one one hack that i did that i did use and then when i when i was coaching students i I encouraged them to do was a lot of the a lot of the banks sort of the um the accountants a lot of these guys use the same companies to to implement their testing so if you go on to and and you can find out actually when you get a link invited to a test you would see what company they are linked to and i would just go and buy some packs from that company um and the 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 question style is really similar this obviously the same questions don't cut up come up that would be that would just be too easy but practice the hell out of it sometimes i do group sessions with friends so four of us would just get up, you know, you know, 30 logical reasoning test uh, questions, sorry, big screen. I remember going to the university library on campus and we'd just look at it. And a lot of friends would tell me, oh, well, it's, it's that shape and it's that shape because it's this and you're missing the rotation or you're missing the flip or whatever. Um, and sometimes just speaking to a couple of friends and doing it together people just see the world slightly differently or recognize different things. So for me, the logical reasoning was one that I really struggled with. The numerical one I was with, I was okay with, but then we'd do the same exercise with, 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 with friends and, you know, we'd all sort of learn, you know, quick things. I remember um, one, one, one student that I worked with, you know, on the numerical testing was, you know, when they were working out the sums, they were putting all the zeros into the calculator. I was saying, look, you know, if it's all millions, you just take out those six zeros. That's just going to save you five seconds each question. You know, there's there's small little hacks that you can do. And working with a couple of friends and buddying up and do these tests and sort of trading tips, um, you can open your eyes to a, a few of these things that help at the margin. But ultimately, just just practice the hell out of them. One thing I would say, big warning, don't get other people to do them for you. I know that that, you know, that always exists. Every, you know the, the the companies cottoned on to that years and years ago you have to resit these tests at um, assessment days a lot of the time and if your score is you know significantly deviates from your score six eight weeks ago it's a bit of a red flag so um while it might feel like you know a good thing to do because you know well I'll, I'll definitely get through by getting my you know super smart mate to do them um you get found out and um yeah you, well, you may get found out eventually so i'd advise not doing that but i'm sure no one's doing that because you know everyone dialed in here is probably a straight <laughs> <it come. laughs> no you, and to validate what you said had a conversation with a client early this week and they now get you to do um sort of mathematical working out in the room with pen and paper in order to stress test those those test results so Absolutely. You're right. You'll come undone. One thing you mentioned there was about you were referring to kind of a collaborative, almost collegiate environment where Mm. people are sharing and learning. Mm. I know that some students have that mentality built in and some don't in terms of then, you know, now you're in the workplace and you've got experience and you're hiring. Can you just kind of give some, some, uh, I guess, some insight as to how important actually being collaborative in your working in the real world is. And that yeah. if you're not treating it that way in the application stage, you're kind of ultimately setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, no, that's fair. And I think that's, I think a lot of the time when you're, you know, nine, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22 and applying these things, you probably think it's you versus the world. And the reality is it isn't. There is, you know, it's very, very competitive, but there are lots of places available um and so whether it's your 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 course mates or your housemates or other people like just sharing experiences with these things is i think really helpful and will ultimately help you i mean there is no role really that i can think of in finance we don't have to work with someone else um there is, there's, there's somewhere teamwork and relationship building is less prominent in the role and it's more technical based but you know even if you think of a you know, well, you know, you know, traders that are operating their own P&L, they, they still have to have good relationships with, you know, the brokers, the other people, the other desks on their team, desks, uh, you know, around the street. Um, so I, I don't I don't really think there's, you know, any sort of 
I can't think there's many places where there's room for complete individuals and opera and people just acting as lone wolves. Um, you know, a lot of these graduate and analyst programs and spring weeks will emphasize teamwork and relation building and coll collaboration because most companies operate uh, very, very complex. Their products are complex. Their clients' needs are complex, and no one person can come up with them on their own. So you have to be, uh, you have to be collaborative. Um, and so you know, most most competency based questions will bring an element of that out. Um, and the good ones will ask you to provide not only examples of you working in a team, but they might say, you know, give me an example of where you worked in a team. Something went wrong. What did you and your team do? Not just what did you do. So. Um, being collaborative, I think, is is super super helpful in the application process, and, and, and you know when you get into the actual programs, the spring weeks, and then you know full time roles, um, there's going to be lots of that anyway. So you might as well start now. I guess that collaborative test really comes, and you must have seen people do this well and people do this badly. When you're in an assessment centre and there yeah. is a group task, there's a lot <laughs> of students will ask me. How do I navigate that so that I stand out in the right way? So what, from what you've seen, you must have seen hundreds of these. Yeah. So what's like a, a good framework of, uh, to think in order to approach that successfully, a group task at assessment center? So generally people make one of two mistakes and they're at the other opposite end of the streams. So they say nothing because nerves are completely understandable or you know, they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to speak over people and things like that. Or they go the other way and they're just far too dominant and and their feedback is that you know you didn't allow the group to speak or you spoke over people striking that balance is is very is is key but also quite hard especially you know for for internship applications it might be your first time that you're going to do these these group exercises i'd say there's a, f a few things I, I do think there are a few a few tricks and a few hacks that can help so firstly all these group exercises are going to be timed you will be cut off at, you know, if it's 20 minutes to discuss and 10 minutes to present, you will be cut off at 20 minutes. There needs to be a timekeeper in the group. You know, someone could say, well, I'll be the timekeeper. And then you know at least that that's a role that you can play. There's nothing to do with the actual case study, but is a chance for you to, every three minutes, right, guys, we've got 10 minutes left. We've got five minutes left. That's a, a small one. Normally with these things, you go into a room, um, there's six of you, eight of you, however many, there's a flip chart where ideas are scrolling down, being scribbled down. Someone's got to be, you know, have the pen in their hand to write on the flip chart. That's the one that I always loved because I used to have this little saying, you know, the, you know, the pen is mighty than the sword. As soon as you've got that, that, that pen in your hand, the debate is going to come through you. People are going to want to see their ideas on the flip chart presented to. And that's a really nice way to, especially if you're a bit more introverted and less comfortable in these group settings, you can sort of be the one that goes and stands you know, by the flip chart and help you know navigate discussion you say you know anthony great idea you know piers what do you think to that and that type of role is really I, I think a way to kind of balance all of that so there's a couple of sort of tricks you do i mean generally speaking over people big no no um you know generally i don't think people are sort of speaking over people too much but that's where some i've seen some shockers over the year where people have had amazing marks in the interview the case study backed up great marks on the test and then they go in to the group exercise and they think they need to just be super dominant, um, you know, and they speak over too many people. And that will, to, the, to your point about how important is collaboration and teamwork, I think if someone fails a group exercise badly, it can write everything off. Now, that's not to scare people, but that's just to sort of say it is a big, important part of, of the day and striking that balance is, is kind of key. Okay, cool. A few more questions have come in for you, Ben. So okay. the next one is... Um, someone's noticed you are CFA qualified mm. and wanted to know to what extent does that help candidates stand out from the crowd? And second question on that, what roles is the CFA more required for? Because I know it's not really applicable for all roles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so and for those that don't know the CFA, the um, is the sort of chartered financial analyst institute it's the you know if you've got the ACA for accounting CFA is the sort of um, asset management some investment banks use it some pro equity guys will have it as well um, but it's kind of the industry standard for for, for those sectors um, is it worth it is it worth doing in terms of you know making applications stand out to be honest if, if 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 companies want you to do CFA they will put they will put you through it on their 
um, on, on the graduate scheme. Um, is it worth doing alongside your studies? Personally, I, I, I don't think so. Um, it is a kind of post-university qualification. Um, to, to be a CFA charter holder, just passing exams isn't enough. You have to have, I think they've just lowered it, but you have to have, I think, four years of you know investment management experience. So it's not like just by passing exams, you can say, look, I'm a CFA charter holder. Um, I would, yeah, so for applications, I would caution i mean i definitely wouldn't go past level one to be honest just below cfa there's the imc the investment management certificate i think that's probably a great way to show that i'm serious about this industry um yeah there's two papers there one's on regs and and the uh, uh, asset management called environment the other one's a bit more technical and goes through the asset classes i say if you if you're quite keen to do some kind of extra studying and get a qualification that's maybe something to think about i mean in it, one one thing that I would consider where that is probably quite good is if you've done, not done a financial based course, maybe that's a, a good thing to try and show. No, I'm you know I've, I'm trying to at least trying to bridge the the technical gap or the knowledge gap, and and, and here's something that I've done that I've not been asked to do. It's sort of extracurricular, and so I can at least you know pick up the language quite easily when I join. Um, saying that a lot of a lot of programs, analyst programs in the, on for asset management at least will will get you to do the IMC in the first couple of weeks of the induction. Um, so I wouldn't say it's needed, but might be a small thing to kind of set set aside. But you know, you guys have a lot on with, you know, studying, a lot of people will be working part time jobs, plus applications, dissertations, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The CFA isn't something that I'd be like, yeah, go and do it. It's gonna it's gonna set you apart. I'd actually rather students spend time on doing other things and developing skills because we will teach you know that the companies will teach you all of this technical stuff. If someone if you've got two applications that you know same uh, same degree, all these other things, and one has gone and done a year traveling and done some really cool stuff and developed some really good skills, or you know got a part time job that's really interesting, or started their own little business or a blog or something, and then another has just done CFA. I probably, you know, most people are probably going to go, well, this is the person that I want to hear from. Um, it sounds more interesting. So, um, so yeah, that's my kind of take. What's yours, Anthony? Yeah. Do you have a view on it? Yeah, I mean, it's probably the second part of that question, which is about, I think a lot of students naively just think it's a good thing to have some going to do it. But mm. going back to the top of the conversation, what role do you want to do? Because mm. I remember a lot of the traders that I used to work with, there's just no need for the yeah. CFA, but you talk to research, there absolutely is a need. Um, yeah. So it really depends because it's not an easy thing to achieve. It's a lot of dedication, a lot of hours, a lot of grafts, and you've got to manage that. You know, when you're working, uh, I can only imagine that the hours you need to put in, the weekends you sacrifice and so on, if it's not actually needed for your career aspirations long term, um, you just got to answer that question. So, you know, if you want to be a PM, for example, in the end, well, then sure. Or you want to work in deep research. But if you just want to be an execution trader, then yeah. yeah, maybe it's not necessary. So I think that's the main thing that I hear from students. They kind of just think it's a good thing to have, so I'll do it. It's like another notch yeah. on my belt. And, and to be really specific on that, I would say, and there'll be stuff on the CFA website that shows the breakdown of candidates and CFA chartholders and what their jobs are. I'd go and look at that. You know, it will be dominated by people in research, people in asset management, um, people in, you know, uh, and that they, a lot of them will be CFA chartholders, but outside of that, not as much. So, you know, anything to do with consulting, audit, uh, there'll be a bit of corporate finance, I think, where CFA is present, but, you know, trading, definitely not. Um, so I, that's probably, you know, if, if people want to double check, well, actually this, this career that I think I'm quite, you know, going down the path towards, is that a typical CFA, um, place or not? Um, I think there is a breakdown on the CFA's website. So I check that out for people that, you know, aren't sure where it lands. Okay. We got one more question come in and then I'll, we'll go back to the application process and talk interviews. So just tackling this question first, uh, I'm not sure if you can speak more broadly, but perhaps for, for, for Schroders and what you know, intimately more mm. the process, but how long does a student need to wait to receive feedback on an assessment center or like when they're going through the process, not an assessment center, let's say a higher view, is it an automatic thing or is it, there's a space of time? 
yeah i mean it it does it does vary even just within within one company it will vary because different roles or different divisions will have you know huge, volume management for a hiring manager is the most difficult thing it's not actually finding the best candidates it's finding the best candidates within you know thousands of applications um i've had some messages on linkedin from people saying oh i've I put my application into these companies. Should I be chasing up? That I, I do kind of advise against. Um, these hiring managers are very, very busy. This is a stressful period of the year for them. Chasing the outcome of your application, I'd, I'd, I'd advise against. But a a, a, um, a video interview, the process from the back end, just for people to know, video interviews will be um, recorded over you know a, a few weeks. Then they will go to. Um, uh, a bunch of uh, people within that division so not just hr they will go to a, so just, let's just say it's 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 um research they will typically go to a bunch of um analysts or pms that are sort of highlighted that they want to get involved in these things they will review those and then and, and give hr some some feedback that process does take a while putting a number on it i just wouldn't want to say because it does vary a lot across different programs just within the same company um, it's definitely, it's definitely going to be more than than probably one to two weeks, I imagine. So if people have say done one last week, the beginning of last week, and not heard, I wouldn't be getting too nervous if you haven't heard back. Um, you know, I, I I sort of encourage you to just try and wait it out. But it is stressful. I hate used to hate waiting for these things, especially as you go through the stages and get knocked out. You know, and you you know you applied for ten, and then there's eight that you get through the test, and then six that you get through the virtuals. It's it is stressful, but um. But yeah, minimum minimum a couple of weeks, I reckon, perhaps longer. Cool. And then, as you've been talking, Henry has come in with a with a fresh question, and and so has said, your experience at the higher view one on one interview stage, are there any specific traits that recruiters look for in a candidate that may not be skill or experience based? Um. I mean, one thing I'd say communication comes across pretty clearly regardless of you know, skill or experience. So being able to keep answers concise and to time, you know, you will get a minute to answer a question. Do not feel you have to use that whole minute. The amount that I see where it's coming through and it's taking ages for this person to get their points across, you know, it can be quite frustrating. Um, so if you've answered the question after 30 seconds with an absolute killer example, uh, you know, then leave it at that and be comfortable just hitting that button, sub, you know, submit, record. I can't remember what it looks like from the other side. But, um, yeah, so try not to ramble on too much. In an actual interview, have you ever had a situation where someone has got a little bit unstuck in their head in how to respond and then had the ability to stop themselves, say to you, I just need a second, and then they've gone again? Because in principle, that sounds like the best plan. But in practice, have you ever seen students do that and try try to recontrol the situation? Because I know it's obviously incredibly nerve wracking doing an interview. Mm. So re rarely, but I, th I can think of I think maybe only once that someone's done that, and it was actually one of that we do a bunch of speed interviews that people do generally with sort of spring weeks and things like that. And one person just knew they were sort of rambling on, and they said they sort of stopped. Like I've actually forgotten the question, and they said I'm a bit nervous. I forgotten your question, so I asked it again. Then they said, "Okay, give me a second, and then gave a uh, you know a really a much better answer. Don't be afraid to do that. It's hard to have that kind of mental presence to recognise that in the moment. But like showing a bit of vulnerability sometimes is actually a really really good way of creating a deep connection with someone. Um, so it, you know if you find that you're rambling on and you're kind of getting lost and your heart's absolutely racing, just take a breath. Just say, "Oh, sorry." I've just got a bit lost in my thought there. Can you remind me the question? Or if you already remember the question, just, you know, I've got lost in my thought. Give us a second. People are going to be pretty kind, I think, in these situations. They know that it's stressful from your guys' perspective. Um, I think that shows real maturity if someone was, was, was to do that in, a, in an interview. Cool. And this time of year, I'm obviously seeing communication with lots of students. One of the things I, I get, the kind of a vibe that rubs off, is that there seems to be a lot of pressure that people, young people feel that they've got to pick the right role and that they're going to be pigeonholed. Mm. If they don't get it right now, the next one or two years, that's going to really ruin my career. 
which I know as someone older <laughs> is definitely not true. But what, what's your perspective on that? I mean, yeah, that, I can see why people think that. I think I used to think it. It's definitely not true. You know, the you're going to have a long career. Like we all are. Anyone sort of under probably mid 40s is going to have a longer career than, you know, probably our parents did, just the nature of longevity and things like that. You will end up doing so many different roles, I'm sure. So I mean, probably so many different industries. Um, I know it feels incredibly kind of, you're standing at the door of the city and this is the channel that you've applied for and, and this is, it's a one way kind of, um, street, but you you kind of you know move away, and there's this whole idea a lot in careers. A minute about the squiggly career, like someone's written a book. I can't remember who it was. I saw it in the FT, and the squiggly career is the one that just moves around lots of different. Um, it might be companies, but it might be different types of roles, and that breadth and different experiences can actually lead to you know people getting you know bigger roles in the future because they're so 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 well rounded. So. Um, there is definitely the flexibility. One great thing about these spring weeks and these internships is, you know, it's, it's a bit of experience. If you're doing your internship and you get to the end, and even if you have an offer, don't feel like, you you know, if you haven't loved that role or, um, you know, that department, it's, it's certainly not too late. You know, I'm 34. I'm sure my career is going to go in lots of different places. A lot of guys, you know, people on the call will be, you know, late teens, early 20s. There's so many different places it's going to go. Um, and I'd, I'd like to think that actually maybe that takes a bit of pressure um, off of some of these experiences as well, because it's not binary. You know, if I don't get this, it's the end of the world. No, it's OK. You know, you learn something, maybe it pushes you to something else. In my first year, I, went, I applied for consulting and I thought consulting was the way that I was going to go forward. Um, didn't end up doing an internship because I was playing hockey, but second year then applied um, well, for a different, slight different type of consulting. Third year, then applied for banking, went into that, then played hockey, came back out, and have now been in asset management for a decade. So it goes so many different places. Um, so yeah, I just encourage people to be as, as you know, broad minded. Yes, try and focus those applications on a channel that you think today that's what you're most suited to, but don't think it's a one way street that you can't sort of you know side step out of into something else. Hmm. And perhaps I could lean into a little bit of the unique skill that you have. You know, you've represented GB, you are training to be at the Olympics. You know, you are an elite within that, that domain, in that sport. And one thing is about mindset, because students feel like there's an overwhelming um, pool of applicants. And mm. how am I going to how am I going to conquer this? And how am I going to land that role? So just dealing with like performance anxiety, managing your expectations, being able to bounce back. I'm sure these were all like daily, weekly routines when you're a professional athlete. What mm. can you draw on and share with the community that you had from playing at that elite level that could be transferred into an application process, for example? Yeah, that's really interesting. I've never really thought about that too much, but... I think, you know, I played a team sport. We talked about sort of, you know, doing applications, finding a couple of buddies that you're sort of going to go through it together a bit, you know, trade some, some war stories. Oh, I got rejected from this. Oh, this interview was terrible. I had a twin brother so we, and I had a good mate that was applying for all this stuff. So we sort of were a bit of a, you know, a bit of a trio. Um, you know, and there were some shockers that, you know, happened in interviews and, and, and uh, case studies and assessment days. And we kind of all told each other about it and kind of learned. Um, so I think that that kind of helps. I mean, the imposter syndrome, like, everyone suffers from it i had it because i never did any internships because i was playing hockey and, and and i thought the only way to get into these analyst programs was via an internship and yes that is a very com that is the most common route but i remember i used to feel a lot of in, 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 imposter syndrome thinking well I haven't, done, I haven't done my internship for this investment bank you know all these other people have done eight weeks at these places i've never been in an office before i've just run around a hockey pitch you know i'm trying to convince people that's relevant is it you know everyone has these doubts so sort of having a couple of people close, um, whether it's on your course, friends, family, et cetera, I'd say, you know, can sort of, you know, share the burden a bit. It is stressful. Just trading these war stories, I think, kind of helps a bit. And, um, and yeah, going through it together. Um, but, yeah, and just know, like, the hit rates for these things are pretty low. You are going to get rejected. Sometimes you'll never get feedback. That will be incredibly frustrating. But that is a, that is a feature of the system when there's thousands of applications. Companies can't give detailed feedback to, back to everyone at all. Um, so knowing a bit from the start, like, you know, 
I'm going to get knocked back quite a few times. Um, just being sort of prepared for it and rolling with the punches a little bit is a bit of a cliche, but you, you don't really have a choice. You know, no one's going to land every every application they submit at at all at all. So, yeah, final final one on the extension of that is <clears throat> obviously going to like an assessment center or those quick fire string of interviews in one day, a super day or something. Mm. What was your process? I know it can be quite unique to athletes to athlete, but is there a process to get yourself in that space to perform in a, from a mental perspective that you feel confident? Yeah. I mean, I would like, there's this, you know, I took it from, from playing sport, you know, practice the nerves away. I did this with my CFA exams. I was like, I'm just going to, I did so many mocks. I was like, I'm just going to practice the nerves away. You're never going to get rid of them all. Nerves are good. Like they, they, they're good. They the adrenaline. It does help you perform, but you don't want too much. So I do like quite a bit of practice. What I would do before these assessment days is really try and think like really try and simplify. What am I go-to examples for the skills that I know this employer is looking for, is this role is looking for. Um, you know, think about three or four of them what, and, and think about what are the two or three things that I'm bringing and really dial that, dial, really simplify it. I remember I used to go in you know, with a notebook and I'd probably just have, you know, eight to 10 bullets, you know, three or four you know, really good examples that I thought would, would, would land well. Two or three, what are Ben's USPs? You know, what are Anthony's USPs? What am I really going to try and get across? And then, you know, cliche, I'd just have a couple of, I'd write a couple of trite sayings at the bottom. You know, I can't remember them now, but something around, you know, bouncing back or something like that. Um, so I'd try and just, because there's so many nerves, your mind can race. Before the assessment day where there's a lot going on, I'd just try and keep it super simple with what were my key messages, really, and not turn up with 50 examples in my head. Yeah, do the fundamentals well, as Michael yeah. Jordan said, <laughs> <laughs> and the rest will take care of itself. So, um, question has come in while we've been talking, and it's a little bit of more of a deep dive into what you were kind of discussing there about transitioning. Some students do come to me, and they might have worked uh, uh, in tax or in audit, mm -hmm. and they want to pivot into banking, an IB, for example, and there's other kind of similar from accountancy into banking it tends to be a quite a common one. So any advice around that, that transitioning when you're maybe two or three years down the road, but you kind of feel like, well, I'm not a grad, but mm. so how, where do I go and where do I slot into these firms when I'm not a grad anymore? I don't, I'm not eligible for these structured programs. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say I'm probably less well-versed in that kind of tra transition. I mean, I know that, you know, the couple of companies that I've worked at, there are experience hire sort of programs. And you'll see that on a lot of the careers websites, there will be ex experience hires roles. I would, the, I would say the role of he headhunters play a much bigger part in that kind of transition. Um, you know, so recruitment agents, headhunters, I think naturally, you know, if I was in that situation, I'd probably try and use them. Um, they're going to get sight of, right, well, if you've just done your accountancy exams and qualified or you're halfway through your actuary, actuarial exams and you just realise it's just not for you, I think actually some of the recruitment consultants and headhunters are, are probably pretty useful there to say, well, actually, I've dealt with this kind of career transition. These are probably your best options. Um, so I'd try and use them as a, as a resource, really. That would be, that's the first thing that kind of comes to mind, which is very different to, you know, Headhunters and recruitment consultants don't really exist at intern and grad grad level because those programs are all set up. But as you you know as you progress beyond the grad scheme and you've gone that, that's where they do and they can be pretty useful. Okay, final final few then. It took the last few minutes. So just going back to this could be in a virtual environment, but I guess it's more probably visible in a assessment day, perhaps when it's on site in person. Is there anything that you observe outside of these structured tasks on a day like that where you're just like yeah that's what i want to see like a behavior for example mm. is there anything so, that you you kind of like to see outside of just answering yeah. the right answers answers to the questions and, and so on um i mean well one thing that came to mind actually was when uh this was quite a few years ago so, so generally at the assessment days the assessors will just stay in one room and people just come in and out of, of, of that room and, you know, you'll be doing some interviews, people come in. I know that one thing happened where 
someone was quite uh, pretty apparently rude to the kind of the front desk person on the assessment day. And we got told in the mock-up, the wash-up. So at the end of the, you have these assessments through the day and then all the assessors, there'll be a wash-up at the end of the day where you're sort of calibrating scores. You're saying, right, well, you know, I like this person, this person, someone else say, well, I didn't actually like them. And you're trying to sort of work out who to give the offers to. Um, there's a situation where someone had been pretty rude and, uh, you know, curt to someone that wasn't involved in the assessment day whatsoever. So that just came to mind. It's like that was an absolute own goal from that individual because they obviously didn't get through. Um, so, you know, as soon as you're in the building, just remember, like, you you sort of, you know, you're always under the you're watch and your behaviour is always going to be sort of looked at. Um, I mean, I think just general, you can sort of tell sometimes when um, people are just comfortable with the other candidates as well. We talked a bit about, you know, collaboration and things like that. Yes, you are against these against these other people on the assessment day. But, but I think that sometimes if you're sort of too competitive and too sort of self-minded, it come, can come across outside of those assessments a, a little bit. So try not to see them as like, you know, the enemy on, on these days. Yes, it's going to be 10 candidates, there'll be six offers or something like that. But there's definitely been cases where people have just come across not not as strongly with you know in the, in the interactions with each other outside of the assessments that that people just pick up a little bit of a vibe and it might put them off cool all right so final question mm. if there was one trait that you think if you distill it down as to yeah. what you would look for if you were hiring for a position on your desk people generally have we can assume the academic requirement is all fairly equal. So what is it that when it comes down to it that you're mm. looking for? Yeah, it'd be one thing and that is intellectual curiosity. So you don't have to have all the academics. Um, you don't have to have had all the, the experience, but if you've clearly evidence that you've gone out and you're really passionate about that industry. So I'm, I'm in equities, I'm in value, value equities is, is the, the, the desk that I sit on. If someone's you know clearly shown an absolute love and interest for value equities, I think that will make up for so many other things. If they're you know if they're not great at communicating, they're super nervous. If they're okay in a group exercise, but but not the best maybe, but then they just come across consistently. They've got a massive passion for for the the, the role itself and evidence that. You know, I've read these books, absolutely loved, you know, in value investing, there's a ton of, you know, uh, books that's been written over the last hundred years. So I've read all these books, I actually run my little own portfolio. It's got no money in, which is fine. Because people always say, oh, do I do have to have a portfolio? No, not necessarily. But if you've got a virtual one, you know, and, and you've discussed these ideas, well, I've looked up that you guys own this stock. Why is it a value investment? For me, that's not value because it's trading on this multiple or whatever. He's like, oh, my God, this person's like so, so interested in this. I think that makes up for so many other things. It's it's a su it's a super strength. Um, so this is nice because actually it comes back to the, one of that first questions. It's like, do I apply for loads of places? Do I apply for you know a few? Really trying to find out what you're passionate about, where your skills are going to be best suited to, is so important. Yes, it, you can change later on, etc. But if you can find that one area that you're really passionate about, that will make life a lot easier through the whole assessment and. In such curiosity is something I'm, we look for all the time. All right, cool. Well, look, we're going to wrap up the session there. Um, I know this has been live, and so there's only so many people that can join. But what I'll probably do is this is the audio is all recorded, so I'll probably put it into a, a wrapper in a podcast and put it, put it out there so as many people as possible can benefit. So, yeah, Ben, absolute pleasure. Great to see you, hear your insights and share your advice. Thank you very much. Cheers, Anthony, and best of luck, everyone.